Welcome to today's program, a special presentation by Innovix Corporation Executive Chairman TJ Rogers. After the presentation, there'll be a Q&A session featuring Innovix Management. With that, I'd like to turn over the call to TJ Rogers to begin. Please go ahead, sir. Hi, my name is TJ Rogers. I'm the uh, chairman of Innovix, and I'm here to make a special presentation to shareholders that was promised about a month and a half ago. I have uh, two guests today three guests today <clears throat> in order from the far side, Ralph Schmidt is our VP of marketing and sales, Ajay Maranthi, who's the new COO and Raj Taluri, who's the, will be the CEO shortly. I'm going to introduce them in detail in the talk. So I won't do more than uh, say hello now. Ready? Okay. Okay, uh, if I had one symbol that would picture why we're here today, it would be this one. This is off my cell phone. Uh, it is a reaction, you know, at eight o'clock on November 2nd, the day after we made our November 1st uh, Q3 earnings call. And uh, this is about as perfect a picture as the investors are unhappy as uh, you can come up with. And yeah, I'm here to talk about that today. <clears throat> It started out, uh, I asked our CFO, uh, what did you say? And I want the exact words from the transcript. I don't want to uh, 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 get some text. And I got this. We expect Fab One improvement activities to extend into 2023, but at a slower rate, given the decision to redirect resources to Gen 2. Given this, we expect to exit 2023 at a run rate of under 1 million battery cells produced from the Gen 1 equipment in Fab 1. There is opportunity for significant outperformance depending on the timing of the completion of ongoing Fab 1 improvement projects. And I read that and I said, I don't get it. And I read it again and I didn't get it. And I finally was saying, okay, what, what did you say? Uh, started to make it clear one of the reasons why we had this precipitous drop. And uh, the next thought I had was, I often say this, Inglés por favor, and we will do Inglés in the future on these uh, calls. <laughs> no more scripts, no more lawyers, people in a room telling you what's going on. Okay, one thing I've got, when you see a box like this in this presentation, it's a quote from a shareholder. Uh, and this is a quote that I picked to represent this image here. Uh, people are openly questioning if the product is manufacturable. Indeed, uh, you know Charlie Anderson, he's our IR guy. I asked him to give me a memo on accurate shareholder feedback and he withheld names so I could use quotes. Uh, by the way, this goes on for seven pages. Uh, First page is interesting. After that, it gets a little wearing on you. Uh, people are openly questioning if the product is manufacturable. Uh, these are from top 10 institutional shareholders, big guys. We're lucky to be at $10. Revenue in 10, 2023 was supposed to be 176 million, now it's 8 million. When you can't name where Fab 2 is going to be, it appears you have no plan. This should be like a biotech. There's a set schedule that everyone can understand with identifiable milestones, and you can update us on the milestones as they are met or not met. And from another shareholder, the problem with your message is that we don't know how to walk, but trust us, we can run. Okay, well, let's say uh, the shareholders uh, challenged us here. And frankly, I don't disagree with any of these. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. Uh, shortly after the crash, uh, uh, I was appointed executive chairman. As chairman, I would come here once a month, plus other meetings, and uh, sit in the boardroom and complain. As the executive chairman, now I come in every day and complain. And uh, I'll do that for about another few weeks, and then, then I'll go back to my, my old job. Uh, I came in and said uh, that the board was going to help. Our board has, by design, several successful operating executives who are committed to spend whatever time is required at Anovix to ensure the company's operational success. We are Silicon and Moore's Law operations people and comprehend a sea change opportunity in Anovix uh, that its technology offers. 
I'd like to point out that the three gentlemen I just introduced here are all Silicon executives, former Silicon executives. Uh, we're going to infuse the Novix with a Silicon industry mindset. I think that industry has been exemplary in the way it has transformed the entire world and grown, you know, over $300 billion. And the, the mindsets that is required to survive in the silicon industry will be in the future required to survive in batteries. Okay, I outlined in that same uh, uh, press release, I outlined three problems. Uh, the lack of clear and transparent investor communications. I do wanna point out that I've worked with the Novix for 10 years and Harold and his team, and it's always been honest. And I'll show you where the, uh, the problems are in communication that led some of our investors to say we outright dishonest with them. I don't think that's true. I think they were reasonably misled, but I don't think it was deliberate. Uh, problem two, the delay in projected underperformance of FAB1, that was that first quote I gave you. And I said here for the record in this old press release, FAB1 is going to work and ship a lot of batteries to our customers, period. And the third problem, the delay of the Gen 2 auto line, that's our engine of copy exact, to use the Intel term, of how we're gonna scale the company up. And the Gen 2 line is that line. Gonna discuss those three things. Uh, I'd like to make a couple other points. Uh, we've got 349 million of your dollars left in the bank. And that money's going to produce world record batteries out of Fab One. And it's gonna create the first Gen 2 auto line. So we don't need any more help to get at least that far. And then at the end, I reread the press release and I put in a line. I said, by the way, the next battery shift from Fab One will be serial number 4163 with zero returns. And I'm proud of that. Uh, my, my days when you got first silicon and then you got your first samples and then you sold them to your first customers, all those were bragging events. And for some reason, I don't know why, uh, that's the very first time we ever said how many cells we have shipped. I'll tell you why in a few minutes. It, it, it's pretty evident. Uh, today, as I sit here, the cumulative number of batteries now shipped is 8,812 through Q4. And we expect to double our shipments every quarter. Now you can say that's small to twice as small, but I can tell you, you start doubling 8812 and you see how long it takes you to get to a number that does have meaning at 10 bucks a battery. Uh, we took Inovix public with a SPAC and I've got a few slides from the SPAC investor presentation here. Um, in order, in order to tell you about us and, and how we think about Inovix. Uh, first of all, the crash to $10 and 74 is our fault too. Uh, after all, uh, our SPAC sold you stock and although it's up, our, our investors are, some of them, quite unhappy, and, and I think they have good reasons. So we'll talk about that today. In the SPAC, uh, again, this is the SPAC uh, S1 presentation. Our SPAC bragged about Enphase, uh, our success at Enphase. In this case, the stock price graph of Enphase over the last few years with a market cap of $18 billion. Uh, I came on the board of Enphase as a favor to uh, 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 Kleiner Perkins that, that invested in my company uh, in 2017. Uh, a few months later, uh, I took an ex Cypress guy, Silicon guy, and asked him to be COO and he accepted. And then almost a year later, uh, the same guy who'd done an outstanding job as COO was promoted to president. So that's kind of the story, get a good Silicon guy and, and get him in there and start changing the culture. And I'm trying to replicate that story here. Uh, this is, we bragged about our uh, Cypress chip auto lines uh, to investors to sell stock that eventually went to Inovix. And here we see an auto line. These are wire bonders, this die attachers, wire bonders. That's a mold in that, mach in that machine there. This machine is uh, 50 meters long. It goes through the wall to the other side. And this was my personal project. That is, I ran the weekly meeting for this. And we built 10 fully automated lines that took chips on blue tape and took them all the way out uh, to put them on tape and reel with a shipping label on them. We built 10 of those lines and that was the back end of Cyprus. I was tired of dealing with, with manual assembly in Asia. 
Uh, line one, just for information, ran 3,600 UPH. And by the time we got line 10 done about two, two or three years later, uh, it was up to 10,000 UPH. So what we're doing has been done before. This is the first example. We also brag in our, in our SPAC about SunPower. Um, SunPower, the company that made black panels at a higher wattage than its competitors. Uh, that, by the way, is my schoolmate, Dick Swanson, who is the CEO of SunPower, and that's the roof of Cypress Semiconductor there. We bragged about the second set of auto lines. Uh, these are the auto lines that ran silicon wafers. Uh, it took us only five months from install to silicon. And, and it took us only 11 months uh, to go from 10% to 90% yield. So this was a good record and we actually modeled, perhaps one of our problems, we actually modeled uh, our plan at, at Inovix after this plan. Uh, we also bragged about uh, the complexity of the SunPower Auto Line, uh, having to include diffusion and in this case, right there, sputtering aluminum, tight, tight tungsten and copper. So this was a complex auto line. We also told people about SunPower's low cost plant that got in Manila to house the auto lines and the people that did it. MinFam, uh, we'll talk about later, but ran manufacturing at Cypress and did the silicon auto lines I showed you. Manny Hernandez, who was the uh, IPO CFO of SunPower. And Greg Rykow, who's a Cypress engineer who we transferred to run uh, the auto lines at, at SunPower. Uh, we deployed four silicon industry executives to watch over Novix. This is at the beginning. So the board included uh, me, Manny, Dan McCraney, and Greg Reichel. I'll talk about these guys later. And then, then we gave the cri S1 criteria for the target company, meaning this was an official document submitted to the SEC saying, what were we trying to find? Because at that time, Enovix had not been identified as the target and was one of several. I'll go quickly through the grading. Public company readiness, to me, that one's still, uh, that one's still out, uh, out to vote. A technically dominant product, we absolutely have it. Customer endorsements, we have them. And I'll give you some more data today. We've been too sparing, I think, on data about customers. Uh, where did we run into problems? Decision making, making decisions and moving on. Uh, taking responsibility for problems. These are cultural problems uh, that we're working on that, that is one of the reasons I'm talking about a silicon shift here. A culture that speaks and writes precisely. Well, you know more about that than I do because you've been on the wrong end of it. A culture that is passionate about delivering results, which they are world-class batteries, but not necessarily on time. Every fuel cell and or battery company I've ever dealt with, and that's been four now, um, have the attitude we're working on something that's very hard to do and therefore takes a little more time and we always get surprised. So we'll, we'll get there when we get there. And of course that doesn't work for a public company. A culture that respects capital. Now, Inovix uh, is a tight company. They, they don't spend money. They, they don't fly first class or anything stupid like that. But they're not tight with capital and they don't have the respect for capital they should. And, and I've held the ground there. Talk more about that later. A company that is impatient with delays in new products or initiatives. We won't tolerate being late with our new product. We won't tolerate being late uh, on the yield curve. And these are the things that, that we're working to change right now. Uh, finishing that list. Uh, we were looking for somebody with a dominant share in a growing, growing medium-sized market. Check, we've got it. We, we don't want to be a tiny player in a huge market. We want to dominate a market, in this case, reportable electronics. Uh, we're looking for a second product on schedule, so you don't get a one product wonder company. They've done that. Silicon Valley company in a formal plan to meet street expectations. Okay, this is the formal plan to meet street expectations. Uh, it was, this is the SPAC, uh, merger with the SPAC. This meant, uh, this meant that it was the pipe plan, the plan that we gave to investors. Harold signed it, this is back in 21, in, in February 21, and I signed it. 
And then in a relatively formal ceremony, we dragged everybody into the boardroom, all of EPs, anybody that had an important number in this plan. And we said, we want you to sign it. And we're going to bring this plan out with your signature on it later if it doesn't work out. In retrospect, that maybe is a little bit too heavy handed. Worked in the silicon world, but what happened? It created fear of failure. Oh my God, what if we don't make the plan? It's really going to happen. And that led to a slowdown of decisions in uh, defensive communication, which you're all aware about, uh, aware of. So my fingerprints, my method of making a people accountable are on, on this culture problem we have as well. It's, it's not just their problem. Uh, this is the pipe plan that we gave to investors, the exact copy of the plan. Uh, and, and all you have to do is look at a few numbers on here to understand what the problem was. Okay, first of all, 2021 revenue NRE, we footnoted it, non-recurring revenue. So we told everybody we would get that. And by the way, I don't want to, uh, I'm not going to talk about NRE revenue today because we will become real by making and shipping product. Uh, but NRE revenue is very important because that means some companies giving us a million bucks or two or $5 million to make batteries for them, a custom battery or to guarantee future, uh, uh, future capacity. So it's important, but not at the expense of, of shipping product revenue. We had a debate. I remember the debate well in the boardroom when we said, should we put the footnote in 2022? Should we say it's going to be a mix of products? revenue. And at that time we felt it would be more product revenue uh, than not, but we decided not to put the footnote in and simply to report revenue as an aggregate. It was against my advice. I, again, I was the chairman, not the executive chairman. If I had my life to go over again, that little two would be in the 11 and we'd, we'd not be having this meeting right now. Okay, then bam, revenue gross of $176 million. That was in the quote. And the assumption there is Fab One, where I'm sitting right now, people making batteries behind me, I would have four lines running. And they would run at a certain efficiency and that efficiency would ramp, et cetera. And when you're sitting back in February, February this year, and you're looking forward and say, gee, that's two and a half years away before the third and fourth quarter of 23, uh, we should be able to get that done. We, we signed up for that. And that was that blue plan I just showed you. So what happened? <clears throat> the lines didn't work. They became manual. And we have 194 operators way above our plan. We have more, we have over 80 in, yield engineers, again, above our plan. And we spent 80 million bucks instead of 34. And I don't, I'm not apologizing for that. We're doing what we have to do to be successful. But this is the first obvious big problem after this one. The, the benefit was on CapEx, we're supposed to spend $117 million. We spent half of that. The reason we spent half of that is the machines didn't work the way we wanted. And I refused to replicate the equipment that wasn't going to make the standard required for us to be successful. That's simple. And there we had a problem uh, I call money poisoning. Uh, when startups that have been grubbing for money for years all of a sudden get a few hundred million in the bank, they sometimes think they can buy their way out and they can't. You cannot replicate equipment that doesn't work perfectly and spend a lot of money and hope it's going to happen. And I hope investors, I get asked, when are you going to take money? You need money. Uh, you may have a liquidity problem. I keep getting pushed by investors. We'll ask you for money. I'll tell you when we're going to ask you for money later on. But right now, money is not our problem. Execution is our problem. Uh, and the, the quote I've got there is, you can't buy your way in. If you want to be a company, you have to be a company. You can't buy one. You can buy a company, but you can't buy your way into being one. By analogy, we have to walk into the ring alone for a 51 heavyweight fight and we have to walk out of that ring. That's what we have to do. And the best analogy I know for that is this one right here. You have to get up at four o'clock in the morning. You have to have your breakfast in three minutes, have your eggs, get your protein and get out and run and start working at four o'clock in the morning. 
And that's what we have to do as a company, not get more money from our investors and spend it. And this is what we're working on right now that I've been talking about. The SPAC provided a, a good board with relevant knowledge. Uh, Greg Reichow, uh built and ran the solar cell plant at, at SunPower, the one I showed you. And he built and ran the Tesla Fremont plant. So obviously a great guy to have on your board. Dan McCraney. Now, again, I, I've got a, uh, this is a, a slide from our SPAC pitch. I've only outlined a couple critical points. McCraney has been on 10 semi, uh, semiconductor boards. He averages six years of tenure. And six of his boards involve significant restructuring. So he tends to go to companies that need help and help fix them up. Manny Hernandez was the CFO of both Cypress and SunPower at their IPO. He ran their IPO and created their financial structure. So he obviously is a great guy to have on the board. He also, by the way, de us in record time. And for me, if I go through my resume, the things that matter, we did our IPO 37 months after a Series A funding, three years and one month, and we built a fab and got it running and got the profitability during that period of time. So what I bring here is an insistence of getting things done quickly. And that, that is countercultural in some, time, in some cases uh, to where I am. I also wrote a book called No Excuses Management. And it was a book on the business processes that were used at Cypress to build a $100 million company from scratch. So it's got a whole lot of stuff in it of how to make a system cheaply with Excel and PowerPoint uh, to get something done before you can afford Oracle or whatever bigger system you're gonna have. I wanna point out to you that the board was active. You, a lot of people wrote me letters, some of them pretty hot. And uh, I want everybody to know that we were active. We started addressing the pipe plan, this, the big one, on August of uh, 2022. Um, on 8-5, on we discussed the CEO change and I've always had an open relationship with Harold. And I went in and told him, I said, Harold, board talked about what if, you know, what if you don't make it? First time ever. And I kept open with him for the entire process. Uh, we launched the COO hiring. At, at first tried to get Min Pham, that didn't work out. A Jay, a Jay was a great, a great catch and I'm equally happy. Uh, we discussed on, on 10 3 we discussed the mechanism for a CEO change. I talked again to Harold. Uh, then I took over the COO search, which was doing is going slowly through the bureaucracy. And I went through my first interview on the telephone to an offer to an acceptance to a press release, which I wrote myself, getting AJ, AJ here. Uh, and I'll, again, I'll show you his resume later. We had the big drop. Uh, then we launched a formal search for a CEO. In that case, the board said, look, our job is to do what's right for our shareholders and we obviously have to look at our options now. And I agreed to that and Harold and I worked on that. But in my case, and when I became the executive chair, I looked at it as the beauty contest. Harold was my candidate. Uh, McCraney was out looking at external candidates and we were trying to find the best option for the company. Now, some of you may be saying, well, you know, really? I, that does sound credible. I, it is credible as, as I'll show you in a minute. We got a J landed, okay? And then that was uh, in October, uh, in November 10th. And then just a few days, Christmas Eve actually, uh, we got a vote uh, to hire Raj as CEO. So in the, in the beauty contest, uh, this guy's resume as I'll show you glows in the dark. And it was, really fortunate for us uh, to find him. Harold was one candidate. Let me just remind you, if I showed you his resume and said, would you work with this guy? Uh, BS Mechanical Engineering, MS from Stanford, ran a company called, he was in a company called Form Factor, ran operations in Form Factor, they IPO'd and they got big and they were the premier probe card maker in the world uh, out of Livermore. Comes from IBM, ran a disk drive fab, real engineer, 94 patent, 63 more patent, co-founded a Novix, raised $789 million. And the current market cap of our company, which we'd like to raise, 
is still $1.9 billion. So I, I just tell you, if this resume floated down Sand Hill, it would get grabbed before it got to the Stanford Shopping Center. Then I came out as the executive chairman uh, with a set of principles, like I want a plan and I want the plan to follow this format. I wasn't trying to dictate the plan, but I was trying to make sure the plan uh, fit, into a, fit into what the company needed. Pretty straightforward. I was griping it was late and I said, I wanna review the plan in the 126 board meeting. We are on schedule for that. And we're actually through a couple of drafts. Uh, by the way, I revised this a couple times in the gray font here is uh, from the revision. Uh, the major assumptions AOP must be clearly stated in writing. It turns out that was more difficult than I thought because that clear thinking committed to writing is, it, it hadn't happened. The AOP financials and milestones should have had, should have 80% achievability. This is your meet and beat number where I don't want an AOP that is great the day you put it out. And then it's the most dreaded thing in the world, like that plan I showed you before when you actually get there. Okay, EPR, PCR system, one bit of jargon, equipment procurement review, process change review. This is how you develop equipment and this is how you measure the process. They're co-developed. This is a Cypress system that was used to develop uh, Moore's Law technology, again, you go back to semiconductors, every two years, your technology becomes obsolete in Moore's Law. You live in a culture that says, I have to be somewhere in two years. And the other cultures, it's not just batteries and fuel cells go, well, you know, we've been working four years in this technology, it's really great. And, and, this is, and, the, and the thought that the Grim Reaper is only two years out there doesn't cross their mind. That's one thing I find about silicon people and, and my other companies. So this system is a formal system that turned multiple turns to develop multiple generations of Moore's Law. It really does work. It's complex, it takes a lot of time. That's because you gotta do a lot of stuff to build a new generation fab. So I said the EPRP, and I'll call it EPR in this presentation, I wanna specified and signed by me before any more POs are placed. So I put the kibosh on POs all manufacturing equipment must be compliant with EPR, PCR. And I warned people because there had been some gaming, people not here anymore, uh, there had been some gaming, gaming the EPR, PCR spec, going through the actions in the form, but not doing the substance will result in termination. Fab one must become economically important, not necessarily profitable. We're, we have a small fab in, in uh, Fremont, California but it has to be economically important. I define that as a million or more in revenue. And I want a customer to disclose that our batteries enable the product. Our watch, cell phone, whatever, couldn't do what it does without Nanovic's battery in it. It wouldn't be as safe as it would be otherwise without Nanovic battery with brake flow in it. And I want some customer to, to like us enough uh, that they'll come out publicly that. So that's a guideline for the plan. Fab one must create and remain on a detailed board approved annual operating plan, AOP manufacturing plan. We're working on that now. Fab two must demonstrate economic viability to the board before it's launched. Uh, there are many, many comments about, you don't know fab two, you haven't said where fab two is gonna be. We bounced around between Utah and Arizona and Texas. Uh, just to, to give you a foreshadowing of what I'm gonna say, it's because we couldn't find a way to make batteries in the United States and make a company that had 20% profit. And that was never our plan. Our original plan was like SunPower. Uh, SunPower put its wafer fabrication plan in the Philippines, Southeast Asia. And that was our original plan. And then we decided, and uh, we decided we were gonna put Fab One here, engineers being close, all the standard arguments. Uh, but we're now talking about the, the production fab. So we'll talk more about that later, but the point is that is gonna be life or death and it better work right and it better be cheap and it better have high yield, make a lot of batteries. Gen two, this is our second generation line. 
must work, and there again I'm saying compliant to the system, as agreed to in writing by Min Pham. So he's uh, a real stickler on this 200 page spec, must follow the spec line by line. And, and I brought him as the consultant. I, had, I did not have enough time to literally spend the weeks here it would have taken uh, to go over EPR, PCR. And besides that, he's better at it than I am. So we've hired him, that's what he's doing for us. Before the board approves any POs, Gen 2 equipment owners will prove to the board in bold that they have embedded all the learning from Gen 1. So Gen 1's not working the way we want it to. I'm gonna explain that in detail in a few minutes. And Gen 2 can't have any of those problems and you have to prove to the board that. The company will prioritize putting brake flow uh, you may have seen the video, it's on our website of our, of our uh, safety device, which prevents or at least limits greatly uh, battery fires as quickly as possible and on the Gen 2 line. I added that in later. And finally, something that looks arcane that's really quite important. All R&D projects must have specified new technology plans and be currently on schedule and fully staffed. A new technology plan is the silicon thing. All silicon companies have this a chip plan. I want to make a chip. It's going to cost $8 million. Here's how many people I need. Here's how long it's going to take. Here's my phase gate plan for milestones. Here's the return on investment. No chip company would launch a chip without that. And I want to get all of our projects here. We only have five right now. All of our projects here on a new technology plan. Uh, so they're all lined up and linked up and that that's that's a problem so short form make fab one start shipping get gen 2 line to work for real and make r d more productive with new technology plants so uh, i put the afterburner on getting a jay marathi in master's degree in ie from texas tech AMD 23 years, I met him at AMD. I actually tried to hire him out of AMD and they promoted him uh, to an equivalent job, the one I was using to hire him and I, I didn't get him at Cyprus. Ran the Thailand plant, which is 6 million units a week and we wanted a guy who does 6 million units a week and thinks that's normal in the company. Uh, VP of Ops for Computation Products, they had him run a business. Uh, this is the one that completed head up with Intel. VP of Ops uh, for Asian Assembly and Test, that was all of Asia, four plants. And his last job there was CEO of AMD India, which was their LLC that was um, the represented in India. After a bunch of time at AMD, he was 10 years at LumaLeds uh, as COO, uh, the lighting company, and uh, at Western Digital, uh, also running operations at the big data storage company one of the best manufacturing guys I've run into for a long time, comparable to the, my guy that I bragged about earlier. Um, we were very happy to get him. That's why I accelerated his offer. So Ajay has come, uh, this is his 49th day. I explained to him yesterday that the 49 days are the free days when he inherits other people's problem on day 50, they become his problem. So in his last day of freedom, uh, here's what he's found in his first 49 days. Thank you, uh, TJ. Uh, really appreciate the introduction, but very quickly, I've uh, in the 38 years I've, I've been in the industry uh, here, mostly and all in Silicon, uh, working for AMD. Uh, many of you might have forgotten, we started at 8286, which is the heart of the, any personal computer. I've handled that RAM all the way from there to its generation microprocessor exceeding the first gigahertz. All those RAMs were similar in nature, vertically straight up, yields not looking good. Focus on all the elements, you know, which is not rocket science, which are given here. Uh, ownership and accountability. Every rejected units, every down machine needs to have an owner. And that's, you know, we have already started this these are list of eight or 10 uh, initiatives, which we have already begun on. Uh, machine centric yield plans, again, not rocket science, specific actions with co-owners. This is all about maintenance, engineering, operations, coexisting, working on problems real time with full ownership and accountability and transparency. Cost of non-quality program, 
this is something you detect mm -hmm. problems early so that they don't accumulate cost and later on get rejected with a much higher cost. So drive down the value of the scrapped units. Again, you might say not rocket science, but operations is not about rocket science. Neither it is about battery science. It is about discipline. It is about hard nose blocking, tackling, and working on these issues. Design for manufacturability. Balance the yields with tolerances without compromising performance, without having quality issues. Whip count, discipline on MES. MES is the manufacturing execution system. Every unit is accounted for. It either gets shipped to a customer or scrapped and accounted for with the owner. The Japanese 5S cleanliness order program. Again, nothing rocket science, very well documented. The 5S is as in sword, uh, straighten, standardize, shine, and then sustain. And added to that is safety, obviously, as I was walking up the stairs today, I forgot to add the 6S. Actually, it should be 6S program. So that's what we are implementing full-blown. World-class supplier program, again, not new to the semiconductor industry, having senior executives on speed dials from the suppliers who you depend on every day to supply you good parts so that you never run into a problem after the after what they supply is here in our premises. I'm a huge, not a fan of incoming quality inspection. Those are gates which are unnecessary, but for that you need a really good supply network which you can depend on. And then limit remote work as much as possible. In this day and age, we're getting used to that back again, but I'm a huge fan of everybody comes to work every day. We are a manufacturing operation. You don't work remotely and, and be effective. So we'll, we'll be working on that very rigorously. And while we are at it, we reorganized manufacturing already, removed one of the layers, uh, redu reduced the number of managers who had the title of managers, but really didn't manage anybody uh, or maybe one or two people. We combined that. This is not just to take care of cost, structure, infrastructure. This has to be all about, you know, significantly improved communication between the top and all the way to the bottom. Every single operator needs to feel responsible for the goals that you know TJ just highlighted in the in the in the initial part of this presentation. And while we are doing this, we're going to double the output, as TJ said, from last quarter to this quarter, and keep doubling it and exceeding that every quarter thereon. So those are my first 49 days. Again, like TJ said, these are all my problems starting today. Actually, they were my the the. What I've been brought up with, they're once day one, they're my problem. So, but we have a great team here, which is working well together. Thank you. Okay, continuing on, uh, I did some manufacturing guiding principles uh, also. Uh, this is an important slide for investors because it's got a lot of the answers to questions in it that you've been asking. First, a couple of terms, proof of concept, POC. It's a process to make equipment heads. So heads are the steel things that touch the product. And you have to show they work with proof of concept. They have to be validated that they do stacking and laser, et cetera. And then they get automated. So you can think of a machine as being heads, like over 100 of them, in automation. For example, a, a conveyor belt. And I'll talk about that later. Now, some terms we've used and, and not with enough definition in our press releases. Quote R&D line, it's an existing Fremont line. It's actually down below us here. Makes 20 batteries a day and it uses line one POC proof of concept equipment. That is the very same as used in manufacturing is used in the R&D line. Line one is the one we brought in an airplane. It's a Fremont wearables line, meaning makes small batteries, uses the same heads, uh, but it's non-functional for automation point of view. That means this rated capacity of 550 UPH is really more like 100, and obviously that wreaks havoc with output and promises. Uh, line one is going to make 180,000 full production revenue quality units in 2023. There'll be a mixture of the TAM cells, the, the wearable cells that sell for five bucks, uh, and the bigger cell phone batteries to sell for 10 bucks. We will continue, uh, it, it, line one will continue to be used for production in the future. Uh, and this is a shareholder comment. Uh, again, I thought it's very relevant, so I brought it in here. 
I would actually like to see you run all out for Gen 1, no matter what it costs to get higher volume. So be it. Even if you did it in a terrible cost structure, you could prove you can manufacture. I don't care if you have to build them by hand. You're absolutely right. Matter of fact, that board quality comment, send me your name and make an application. Yield in line one, zero for four months. Scary, I'll talk about this later. It's 42 and a half percent as we sit here and that's a real number, a rolling average. And we're gonna get to 60% by the end of the year. Line two is in fab one. It's only a partial line. We, on, we only built half the line. This is the cell phone battery line, different size battery. So we've got the laser cut and, and stack uh, with POC equipment, but it doesn't have the back end, the bagging. Uh, and we did that because we didn't want to commit to the second half of the line two until line one worked. That was the savings of money I showed earlier. Line two units will be sealed and tested in the existing Fremont facility. Line two will be activated to make uh, 5,600 units this year. And when Gen two turns on, line two will be obsoleted. We will pull a plug and move the next thing into fab one that we need to work on at that time. The Gen two line uses mainly the same POC heads uh, that line one does, but it's more parallel and faster. 1,350 UPH, I'll talk more about the credibility of that in a minute. Its nameplate capacity is 9.5 million units a year at 80% OEE. 80% OEE means 80% of the theoretical output if it ran perfectly 24 by seven every day. And that's an achievable number in a good manufacturing line. But I've bolded when ramped. Uh, one of the problems I have, some investors think, you know, we get a sign a PO one, not one, more like 30. And then a quarter later, you get the machine and a quarter later, you start printing hundred dollar bills, not the way it works. But these ramps, the first one's going to take a year. I just bragged about a 50 week ramp uh, for sun power. And after that, they'll turn on a lot faster. The gen two line will go to a new fab two in an existing Southeast Asian low cost site. Uh, it's going to be offshore because we need to make money in the long haul. And that's new and different from what you've seen before. And it's a, it's a, it's a consistent with our original plan. And we will announce to you what that site is by July, 2023. We're having a, a uh, negotiations right now with the various countries in order to get the best deal. Design is, and by the way, this is the reason right here, this, this thing hanging over us that we kept waffling on the, on the gen, on the fab two site. Design is completed and, and the gen two line design is completed and will be board approved by March 15th, period. That's the day you're gonna see the approval or earlier. Uh, we will be delivered, uh, the Gen 2 line will be delivered to Fab 2 in November, 2023. I validated that number twice today. And there will be four Gen 2 lines in Fab 2 by Q424. In other words, that, that right now, we don't know if that's a four line site or an eight or 12 line site, but it will be at least four and these things will be coming out one a quarter. By the way, that's the first time we're gonna need money because those three lines, uh, three new lines will be 150 million bucks. There's a thing called the agility line. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's a new faster and Fremont R&D line. It'll be downstairs. It uses the Gen 2 components. So it looks like Gen 2. It can make things quickly and it'll obsolete our R&D line, which is, you know, uh, old now. So on this quote, selecting the FAB2 location is a powerful thing. You're absolutely right. Uh, and by the way, we can wait until July because that July will not delay money. Okay, this is a picture of the line running and we are explaining the line running. This is from our pipe presentation. Shareholder comment, the real problem is execution. By my math, Fab One is doing less than 10% of what it should be doing. Absolutely right. I want to explain right now. Fab One will make an eight, a 3D battery every two seconds and has four lines, meaning one every eight seconds uh, for two lines, for example. Um, excuse me, eight seconds for one line. Okay, what happens? This is, if you want to ask which slide you showed in the pipe presentation, exemplifies what went wrong the most. Here it is. 
first of all, the two seconds uh, went to 4.1 because we only had two lines. I'm giving the second half line, it'll run, uh, it'll make the, the, its capacity if we run at high OEE and high UPH. It then goes to 22 and a half seconds when we lost the automation and the, and the UPH dropped from 550 to 100. And it then went to 72 seconds when the, when the OEE dropped because of the lack of automation and the need to do manual stuff and the yield problem. So what we started out as a battery every two seconds, ended up battery every 72 seconds, a battery a minute roughly. And that's been the problem and it's got multiple causes. We'll address those in the plan to fix them in a minute. Investor said you need to articulate the exact changes between Gen 1 and Gen 2 and why it doesn't require a miracle to deliver much higher throughput with high yield. You're absolutely right, sir. <clears throat> this is a head. <clears throat> These are anodes. You can tell because there's copper there. The black stuff is silicon. These are stripes that get stacked into a battery. This head is punching them out of the strip where they got made and stacking them. This is a, there's, this is a stacker head here. In this case, they're putting, this, this stacker is putting on, the white stuff is the separator piece of plastic. So you stack, you stack the battery, anode separator, cathode separator, anode separator, et cetera, 100 high. So that is one head. <laughs> After you stack it, there it is. And this is this fixture. So when this stack uh, gets moved around the factory, it gets moved in a fixture. I showed you electrode stacking. This is constraint application. Here's where the stack gets the stainless steel wrapped around it. That is part the integral part of the battery. And interconnect, where in effect the edges are finished and connected to the leads on the outside. So you can see how the heads, one after the other, produce the battery. <clears throat> Heads are what make the battery. Gen 2 versus Gen 1 is about how many heads there are and how they are transported, not redesigning the heads. That is, Gen 2 is not a from scratch redesign for the Gen 1 system. <clears throat> Gen 2 is about more heads in parallel. And there is a little bit of redesign. <clears throat> and I'll talk about that in a minute. So there's the fixture and the stack. There's a conveyor belt. And this is how it moves around the factory. So this is a common fixture that handles the battery in the machine, and this is how it moves. By the way, the precision of uh, this belt, after what's called a preciser, is 100 microns, meaning 0 0.1 millimeters is how accurate this belt can place something, and that's not quite good enough for a battery. <clears throat> so here's Gen 2 versus Gen 1, some parameters. Placement, conveyor belt goes to linear motors, uh, little things that move along and grab on to distancing markers, taking the accuracy from 100 to 20 microns. It's uh, Gen 2 is wider. In the case, it's three wide for the laser, five wide on Gen 2, and up to 12 wide on the baking station where the bake takes some time and we need to get through it at speed. <laughs> Not enough metrology on Gen 1. That got fixed on Gen 2. Uh, cost on Gen 1 was low, Gen 2 is higher. The UPH was rated at 550 nameplate. We don't think that machine, if we worked on it forever, would be over 200. And we have 1350, and an obvious question is, so is that real? This means the depreciation per unit is higher uh, on, on Gen 1 than on Gen 2. And, and this, this will be the benefit, but the real benefit is Gen 2 is going to work and Gen 1 doesn't. Gen 1's a manual system. Uh, Gen 1 has 45 heads on it. Gen 2 is 120. Now here's the key is, it, are you gonna start all over? Only 13 of the 120 heads are completely redesigned. And of those 13 heads, there's only three different types of head. They are used multiple times. So this is a graph of Gen 2 heads uh, and versus Gen 1 heads. And here you see the zones so let's take the first zone, cathode, anode, separator, laminator. So these are, this, this is cutting the materials before it goes to the battery. We go from three to five lasers 
on Gen 2. And we're also changing the laser power to a kilowatt, but it's the same laser from the same vendor with a, a souped up uh, engine inside of it. And so we think this is not a big change. Yellow indicates a minor change, but a change. And red indicates a major redesign. So in this section, zone one and zone two of the machine, these are all the steps. Uh, the big one is a bus bar, uh, DSR. I don't know that one, a slot fill. This, this is the section where the, the waves of the battery, the sections of the battery are connected. And that's been redesigned. There was nothing in Gen 1. The Gen 1 equipment, we didn't know how to do it. We didn't order it. That's why we didn't order the second half of line two. Now we're doing it. And this is obviously a big risk and a big focus. Here's the second half of the line, zone three, zone four, zone five. You can see almost nothing has changed in, in the second half. So the conclusion is, um, or the, the request was, you could have a slide that shows all the steps are the same and that this doesn't require total recalibration. I, I think this illustrates that, but obviously this, this is a risk. It's got to work. Okay, I got a quote now. This is from the book, The Right Stuff, which uh, changed my life. Uh, and it's, it was about test pilots and eventually the space program. This particular quote is when the Russians beat us to space uh, for the first astronaut. And the relevance of this is, well, Soviet's chief designer was what they were worried about. He had to keep smiling. He being uh, John Glenn had to keep smiling and aw shucking and playing Mr. Modest, just as if it might in fact be he who was going in the top of the rocket on May 2nd as the first man in the world to risk a mighty shot to space. And then early in the morning of April 12th, the fabulous but anonymous building of the integral chief designer of Sputniks struck another as cruel but dramatic blows. Just 20 days before the first scheduled Mercury, Mercury flight, he sent a five-ton Sputnik called Vostok 1 into orbit around the Earth with a man on board. The first cosmonaut, a 27-year-old test pilot named Yuri Gagarin, uh, Vostok 1 completed one orbit, then brought Gagarin down safely on land near the Soviet village of Smilovka. It was is, as if the Soviet's chief designer, that invisible genius, was toying with them. I'm not going to pretend that line one didn't have some component in it of design. And, and, and I felt that, and it wasn't developed right. Then we hired our chief designer. Uh, when he came into the boardroom, he'll remember, I got out my cell phone and I pulled up a song from 1969 the key words of which were, where were you when we needed you? And I played it for him in the boardroom. The guys were smiling. So I'm going to give you our unnamed chief designer because I don't want anybody to know who he is. That's our guy right there. He's former member of Romanian Naval Special Forces, and he is not going to fail. He's a good designer. Anonymous. Milestones. This is one thing that will be signed in the plan, all three of us. I checked on this thing four times today. I think it's right. Uh, if we change this from what you have, and by the way, we're going to give you this copy, we will let you know. Haven't got time to go through the milestones, but design of the equipment, placing the purchase. Here's why we can't just say, here's the purchase order. Seven purchase orders. Factory acceptance test. We go to their plant with a team. Installation. Site acceptance test, their team comes to our site, make sure it runs at speed to spec. Line functionality, this is a, this is the spec EPR PCR I told you about before, make sure it works. Then we finally do samples and this engineering samples 10. Uh, then we have production, PCR three is production. Then we have the qual samples and then we have production. So these are the numbers of these things. And these are the numbers as they happen. So for example, an engineering design review on the line Gen 2, uh, we've got 17 done. Uh, we'll have 17 done at the end of Q2 and 17 at the end of Q3 and so on and so forth. What does that mean? Installation, 16 lines will be installed this year. 16 machines will be installed this year. 18 in the first quarter of next year. That's when it'll be done. 
Uh, we're going to have samples, our first samples, a thousand of them, and it's actually in April, uh, but I have a mistake there. This slide in perfect shape will be in the deck we attach. I want to talk about yield. People are worried about yield. Is the product makeable? This is our unnamed yield manager. He's pretty good. Uh, I, I looked at this year, weekly yield review frequently. Uh, this is what one page looks like, stacking. I showed you the stacking module. Well, there's yield by week, there's the number of failed units by week, and then there's the Pareto of code and cause of the lost units in the last seven days. This is a close up of the Pareto. So what this team of engineers does is they work on the big bars and they beat on them. 10 Pareto graphs, this is one of 10. 10 teams of about eight people each, cross-functional engineers, me mechanical engineers, battery experts on each team. And we got these guys beating on 10 Paretos. So the overall yield for this, in this report, there, there's 10 yield panels. You can see some of the yields are consistently high. You can see some, this is the one we dug our way out on, on, on the integration. You can see which ones they have high risk. They're worried about these two, uh, medium risk, low risk. Here's their learning curve. This is extremely important. Up here, the yield is zero. The failures are hundred percent. You always graph defects in a yield curve, 40% yield and hundred percent yield. Here's the yield. These are actual weekly data points. You can see for four months, we're shut out. We couldn't get the sucker to run. Then we finally got it turned on and we started improving at the rate of 3.1 percentage points per week. Once you get the engine running, this is classic, then you start learning faster. And that was 11 percentage points per week. In the future, uh, this, this curve is well known in silicon. It's the S curve and it'll, it'll flatten out as you start you know, having fewer and fewer defects to work on. This is a good yield effort. This is a silicon yield effort. This is the effort that would typify any top silicon uh, semiconductor company. Our yield team is very competent, making good progress. That's the only point I wanna leave with you. Okay, I'm talking about requirements for safety and accelerated testing. This is the specification, that's its number and revision. And I just wanna make one point. Um, one, our fab, one return rate is zero out of 8812 so far. By the way, I got notified today, you, the level of honesty here is great. We have a letter from one customer about one unit and they say they have, a, they have one unit that has got, uh, it's, it's uh, swelling. Okay, so it's still zero. We haven't gotten that as a return. We probably will, just be honest with you. Okay, this is spec, the, the section 513. I'm trying to illustrate what a spec looks excite, like inside of this company. So we do, um, we do this is electrical testing, high temperature, overcharge, drop pinch, crest impact, nail pin, you've seen my picture on the nail pin. Here's the number of cells our spec says we need. We need 600 units. And this is not the only expect, this is uh, accelerated lifetime. We also have accelerated lifetime margin where you do all this uh, to extreme. We have United Nations 38.3, which is required to get in an airplane, needs 40 units for that. We have UL, we have IEC, which is European equivalent of UL, and most countries have a set of specs. So the point is, every time we change the battery, this is what our requirement is for what we have to do and do testing. This is why it takes so many engineers in the battery world. <laughs> I'd like now to talk about sales a little bit. Uh, I, you guys know Ralph, he's been here for over a year. Uh, comes out of Rutgers, Rutgers BSEE. Uh, he just, he joined us two years ago or last year really. Uh, he's, he's after, he was the turnaround CEO for six year, 16 years, was at various companies. Uh, before that he was at Cyprus. He was the EVP of sales, marketing and biz dev at Cyprus. Uh, so I, I know him quite well. His specialty is new market development and customer acquisition. I brought Ralph here 
in case I get asked a detailed question about a customer I can't answer. I, I'm into this, you'll see to the level I'm into it, but I wanted them here. Ralph and I created some new customer funnel metrics that we're gonna share with customers for the first time. Our shareholders say design wins translating to customer purchase contracts would be useful value, value drivers, which give investors a better line of sight on revenue going forward. You're right. So that's what we're going to do right now. So this is the funnel that will eventually fill in this graph. The milestones in the funnel are ES10 engineering samples. Uh, we stand behind them. They work. They'll meet the data sheet. Custom samples. We made your battery to your specs, so it's your size. Maybe use some component you want. So these are the beginning points. You start here with a standard battery or here with a custom battery. You then go to production cell call call samples 100. So now instead of one seat, two seats, you're dealing with 100 to 1,000. Uh, by the way, three to nine months, six to nine months, four to six months, here's the duration of each of these. Then you move on to product integration where they buy 1,000 cells because they're going to make 1,000 watches or cell phones or whatever. And that takes months to do because they got to do their drop, kick, pinch, crush test as well. Then they finally buy pre-production and you know, 10,000 units is, is this hefty number, but uh, these guys are in consumer electronics and they consume that much. Pre-production units, and this is when they start shipping to customers. And then finally, this is the first million dollars. So these are the milestones in our funnel that describe where customers are. Now I'm gonna tell you some of our customers to an 80% approximation, we're not allowed to use their name, but I'm gonna tell you some of them and where they are in the funnel. This is the funnel as of the beginning of last year, the year before last actually now. Uh, 43 counts had been a sample from the pilot line. Most of them were doing ES10 and several of them were customers, uh, custom samples. Now, what is the key? Take this guy right here, it's S14, what does that mean? S means a strategic account. S star means a mega cap strategic account. A key account, which a strategic is top three in this business. A key is top 10 in this business. A lead, first application in a new area or venture. So these are our keys for what type of customer. So S star is a mega cap customer in the top three. The color signifies where they are. In this case, it's wearable. We also have colors. You can see them over here for mobile phone laptop and other. So we have all of these um, uh, customers, 43 of them. And that's where we were a little bit over a year ago, like a year and three weeks ago. By the way, this customer is Samsung. Uh, we thank Samsung, appreciate the fact they let us put out a press release. And, and you can see them there right there. And they were one of our early customers. Okay, other customers. Uh, this slide will not be in the deck we hang on, but today, Light On, Milwaukee, Canon, Panasonic, Sonos, Casio, Nintendo, Samsung, United States Army, Braun, Genius, and Oppo. Uh, Genius is a watch company, and Oppo is a cell phone company in China. So these are companies that, for which we do not have an NDO, and we just let you know that, that these names are real. And you know, when you see a high number like 49, that means there's, that's number 49. Okay, now what had changed? December 21, moving forward to December 22. Fab one enabled the progression to go to qual qualification samples. This is where you qualify the fab, not just the technology. A thousand samples and 10,000 samples. We moved up to 20, 78 accounts. And here's what the map looks like now. We've now got one account, L05, that's uh, out of 10,000 units. Here's our plan for 2023. So you start out where we are today, and the question is what will it look like at the end of this year? So this is our plan. And you can see it shifted some. We've got more people coming in. Uh, we moved through the funnel, and L05, is, is our plan to, to go to first million dollars. That's going to be our biggest customer. Uh, the way this works is this gray arrow says salesman number one in the United States is responsible uh, for keeping track of this customer 
on the on the, on the customer side in, in watching this movement. Salesman number one, light gray, also has these other actions he's got to achieve, and these are part of his uh, his plan, uh, his his uh, what we call critical success factors. Salesman number two is Asia and United States. There's his plan. And salesman number three is Asia only, and there's his plan. So this graph is kind of messy, but it gives you down to the customer name and the customer milestone and the change in the customer milestone in the center of sales plan this year. Ralph has done a good job organizing sales. And we spent so much time uh, talking about other things. We don't really know it. I'd like to thank uh, one of our investors, Greg Reyes, who sent a letter nine months ago and said, you ought to use codes like this. And uh, we did it, uh, Ralph and I did it. So th this, this now is the Reyes format, if you want to call it that, uh, for sales. So DO1 has taken 3,000 cells, 1,600, 1,100. People have taken five cells. The number of customer cells added up to 8812. And here's what we ship by quarter. So last quarter was 4442. And next quarter, we forecasted nine, which is doubling. Now you can say, well, those are small numbers, but nine doubled is 18, doubled is 36, doubled is 72, doubles 144. So that's a curve about as steep as any company can do. If you put the data I just gave you into ordinary funnel statistics, we have a $13 million TAM by 2025. ES10 engagements and the other engagements farther down the pipe are 750 and 669. They're equally divided. These two added together $1.42 billion. So we've touched, dealt with, have connections to about 11% of our TAM. So our sales efforts working well and they really badly need those 180,000 batteries to come out of Fab 1. And Fab 1 needs to deliver because Fab 2 doesn't exist yet. It's that simple. So um, here's the new CEO. His name is uh, Raj Chaluri. He, he will be here on the 18th. And I will gladly go back to um, being, being a director. Raj's got a PhD in electrical engineering from UT Austin. Uh, he worked at Micron for four years, senior vice president and general manager of the mobile business unit that is taking Micron's standard DRAMs and flash memories and customizing them for mobile cell phones and, and wearables uh, to get better ASP and better customer lock-in. That's a $6 billion division. He did the same kind of job at Qualcomm on their IoT line and the CDMA line before that. And before that, he worked at TI for a bunch of years doing the product lines, OMAP is their DSP processor, their wireless product line, imaging, audio, digital still cameras and came up through the technical ranks. Uh, I said before, it's a uh, resume that glows in the dark. He specializes in new products, business unit management and business processes to achieve the above. I'd like to introduce Raj. Now he's been here the second time he's been in the building. So don't ask many questions. <clears throat> now, thank you very much, uh, TJ. And uh, really my pleasure to be here and uh, super excited uh, to be joining the Enovix team on 18th. And uh, as TJ mentioned, I have 30 years in the industry. I worked on uh, many, many different products from concepts to you know early stages to ramping millions of units a month. And I understand what it takes, uh, the discipline, the structure, the processes to go from uh, early samples to high volume production, great quality with no returns. I'm super excited to uh, take this technology, you know, with partnering with Ajay, to the next level and ship millions of units. And uh, I have great customer relationship with almost, uh, you know, all the cell phone and also the consumer electronics companies uh, over the past 30 years that I've built. And uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun to build this. And one thing I'll say, you know, why I'm super excited by the batteries is, um, you know, in this portable electronics and even cell phones and PCs and so on, if you look at the last, I don't know, decade or two that I've been associated with them, the processors, the memory, and almost every semiconductor component has grown leaps and bounds in terms of the performance, in terms of clock speed, in terms of you know, user experience, but the batteries haven't kept up. Now, if the batteries actually kept up at that rate, you can imagine what the 
user experience of these products would be. Even now, in many of these products, the processors, the memories throttle the performance because they don't have enough battery capacity. So I feel like building great batteries, like we are you know, about to at Anovix, will really not only create great value and business for Anovix, but I think it'll also do a phenomenal job of great user experience for all the people who buy these devices. So thank you very much. Super excited to start here soon. Okay. Last slide. Second last slide. Fab One is finally working. 88, 12 units ship yields at 40% and rising. We got a great new COO, Ajay. We'll ship 180,000 units in 2023. Gen 2 will be board approved on that date, come hell or high water. Uh, it's faster in automation than, than a Gen 1. It will be installed in a Fab 2, will be in Southeast Asia, where we plan to put four lines uh, quarterly in 24. And we'll have samples on 4 15 24. So here I, I got the date down to a day because these days are too important to talk about quarters. Uh, we have a stellar new CEO. We'll refine our strategy, install R&D processes, and instill a PL mentality in the corporation. And we plan on winning, folks. So, uh, we're supposed to have music here. I found out my space age size at 40 seconds, so it's slow. We'll now begin the Q&A session. Please note that this call is being recorded. If you have joined via the Zoom application, please use the raise hand functionality to ask a question. If you have joined via the audio line, press star nine. Questions will be answered in the order that they are received. We will now pause for a moment to assemble the queue. Our first question comes from Bill Peterson from JP Morgan. You may unmute and ask your question. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks for doing this, uh, TJ. Nice to see in your Packers uh, green and yellow there. Um, you know, you brought uh, AJ back, you know, as CEO back in November. Uh, the new CEO, obviously, last last week you announced. Um, nice to see Raj there. I guess what other areas you see as important areas to focus and scale production? Any particular areas you see you need to bolster from here? Um, I guess what other resources do you have from your past experiences, areas like Cypress or prior ventures? that you could bring on board or, or, you know, consult with. You get it? Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, if I can repeat the, just real quickly, the question uh, with me on board as a CEO and Raj on board as a CEO, uh, the question really was uh, who else are we or what, what is the other, uh, what are some of the other uh, team members who would uh, come from uh, TJ's prior experience or mine? Actually, we definitely we are going to assemble a team. We're going to continuously look for the the talent that we can trust and you know who we have worked with in the past, who uh, have been in similar ramps. As I mentioned, you know I have a, a you know a lot of experience ramping you know vertically straight up, uh, especially in the last ten years at Lumilets. We were ramping uh, for a uh, cell phone company not too far away from here, um, you know, and and the ramps as you know are pretty crazy. And in there we have you know, uh, a talented group of people who helped actually do that. So yes, I, you know, I'm definitely, I'm going to bring more people um, as, as we go along here uh, in terms of, uh, you know, talent. So Raj, you can, uh, you want to add some? Yeah, I mean, my, my you know, again, I, I'm looking forward to starting here. And once I start, um, you know, I think I'll understand what else is needed. And uh, clearly 30 years spanning many, many, uh, 
you know, you know, TI, Qualcomm, Micron, been in the industry for a long time. I do know a lot of people, but just depends upon the gaps, depends upon what we need, what we have here. And uh, maybe at the next time we have this call, I'll have a better answer. If I can sneak one more in, and, and really that was also kind of a question for TJ if you, as he sees it in his seat. But the, the, the next question I have is, I think when you looked at the, the timeline you put forth, it looks like there's now another maybe one or two quarter delay versus at least uh, maybe our prior expectations. We kind of felt that the tools are going to be arriving, I think, towards the end of next year, maybe some early revenues in early 24. Um, I just want to make sure if that's the case. Is that is that a delay? And if so, what what is the sort of nature of the one to two quarter delay um, as you see it today versus maybe a quarter ago when you when you uh, mentioned it? The uh, primary difference is the, the new unnamed designer. Uh, the, the fact that he's checking every single module, uh, the fact that he's got to run at 1350 UPH, and frankly, a more careful scheduling process. Um, I called uh, the designer himself four times in the last two days. I called a Jay six times in the last two days and all of the calls were tell me that this number is right tell me why i should believe that number so nobody can ever promise that a plan's going to happen but i can tell you this is a carefully done plan and we're behind it uh and why the old plan was what it was um it, I, I don't know you know I, I approved it somebody presented a plan i was in the board meeting and i approved it so i i have my fingerprints on it now I'm giving you my plan. That's the best I can give as executive chairman and uh, with with personal work into it. And yes, there's no, a delay. The yes. No, I appreciate the candidness in this and I'll pass it along. Our next question comes from Gabe Dowd from Cowan. You may unmute and ask your question. Hey, thanks, TJ, for uh, for doing this great, great detail. And, and nice to meet you, uh, uh, Raj and, uh, and Ajay. Just um, maybe following up, TJ, on uh, FAB2, expecting four lines to be there by Q4-24, and you, you kind of noted the first line to get ramped up may take about 50 weeks or so. So just curious, what, what kind of incremental improvement can we expect to, to get the, the additional lines ramped up to, to full capacity? What, does it go from 50 weeks to, to 30 weeks? Just, just how do we think about that timing and improvement? Okay, let, let me... Uh have a J answer that one because he'll be fully in charge of that at that time. Yeah, so uh, uh, as we alluded earlier, actually, there's a EPR PCR process, which is, you know, the equipment, you know, uh, uh, equipment as well as process certification uh, process that, you know, we go through, uh, making sure every process capability has, you know, a value of more than 1.3. All that strict discipline of following the process will let us learn very quickly on, on the Gen 2 line one. And you can imagine the 50 weeks, you know, that TJ talked about for the first line of that kind at a high UPH 1350, high availability, that will shrink rapidly from line two onwards. So the schedule we have put in here is our best estimate uh, from that learning, what we could do, you know, from line two to four, uh, as we see it today. Let me make one other comment. Uh, and that is, uh, we've already got a down payment on that yield curve. <laughs> Since the heads and the lines are highly similar, uh, errors you have in placement or, or some other error, head related, we've taken our yield from zero. We suffered through four months of zero yield. We're now at 42%. By the end of this year, we'll be at 60%. I expect line two to turn on very near 60%. It may have a few weeks uh, below that. But that line is not going to start at zero and work its way up. That line is going to start at a significant yield. And at 1,350 UPH, it's going to crank volume. Even, even if its yields are uneconomic in the very beginning, it's going to be able to crank volume. Got it. Thanks, guys. That's helpful. Um, and then maybe just going back to Fab 1, you'd mentioned um, the, the, the units out of there for 2023, and then the second line ultimately will become obsolete. But just... I guess just curious though, in terms of wearables, what will the capacity be at a Fab One ultimately? And then 
Um, as far as just EV cells and, and qualifying those, would that be made on the on the auto line? Just also trying to figure out where that fits into the mix. Thanks, guys. Yes, I'll take that. Uh, so the total Fab One output, uh, as we are expecting, as it ramps up, you know, after a certain point, I think uh, TJ showed the S curve, you know, where the learning kind of plateaus, and we, you know, kind of sustain at that point. Uh, it will basically take us right around 200,000 cells a year, 200 to 250, somewhere in there. Uh, and those are all wearable cells, small cells, as we call it. And all the larger cells, the laptop or uh, the cell phone cells, will be mostly all done on uh, the Gen 2 line, which will be uh, getting installed, you know, towards the end of uh, 23, beginning of 24. Thanks, Ajay. And then, yeah, just curious, the, the EV cells, the, the 270 milliamp uh, uh, cells that you're making, uh, I guess, are those, is, it, is that in, in FAB 2, or will that be on the agility line at, at FAB 1? E EV. He's talking EV. Oh, he's talking about EV. Was he talking about EV? What batteries were you talking about? Excuse me, the EV cells that you're you're sending to, to customers? Okay, so we didn't we didn't talk about EV today. Those cells are made in the R and D line here. Uh, the technology for making EV cells, the methodology is different. Uh, so we will be in the sampling cooperative mode on EV. Uh, we have a separate division on EV, it's small, but it's quite effective in gaining traction. And we can't really afford right now a lot more than that. Uh, but that'll be the topic of a different a different meeting uh, of what's happening with EV. We're, I, I, I already went an hour today, and if I had bragged about our EV stuff, it would have gone even farther. But, but yes, we're still doing it. A uh, five-person team will cooperate with partners working on doing that right now. This is about where Innovix was in, in electronics batteries two and a half years ago on, on the EV side. Got it. Very helpful. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from Colin Rush from Oppenheimer. You may unmute and ask your question. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Right. You know, you talked a lot about corporate culture and, and accountability here and, and bringing in some new management is an important step towards that. But can you talk a little bit about your expectation for the the transformation of the, the organizational culture and how long that's going to take? Let him do that. We'll, uh, we'll let the new guy do that because he's, <laughs> he's been here exactly two, two times for three hours each. No, I mean, I, you know, I, I think my, my, uh, my experience, you know, as I moved from different companies, the culture is different in each company, but I feel like what I've, what I've learned over the years is that uh, transformations can happen pretty quickly. I mean, the key thing is to understand what's working, what's not working, put together the right processes, the right discipline and the right structure and the right people in place. Uh, you know, I think when a company moves from a stage of making early prototypes, sampling to high volume production, it's been done many, many times. I mean, it's not new and we do it all the time, but it's just a change process. And really it's the structure, the discipline and uh, right people in the right roles. So I expect to get it done pretty quickly, but I'll have a much better answer after I start, but I'm not worried about it. So, uh, okay, perfect. Uh, let me add a little bit to that, actually, just a little color, actually. Um, so after 49 days, I'm a lot more senior, a lot more senior than my, than the CEO. <laughs> but I will uh, say this, that the culture really starts with, uh, with the management team and how we are leading by example, right? And the accountability and transparency urgency, which I think DJ talked about a little bit. You know, we are moving, we are transforming the company, obviously, from a research development, small, very small volume, you know, a fewer customers being sampled, et cetera, to a, what you saw today. You know, we are talking about big numbers, 100, you know, even yeah, all the way to 10K samples per customer, important customers, you saw the customer list. And the culture will begin at with us, with the management team, right? And I, you know, I've changed cultures. I have, you know, I've done a lot of that in the in the 38 years. So, and But wherever we, you know, have, the management team leading by example, it always ends in the right culture. 
Okay, thanks, guys. And then you talked a, a, a bit about the capital need for FAB2 and, and how much these lines are going to cost. And certainly, I'm sure you've thought about where that capital is coming from. Certainly, the customers are, are concerned about that and potentially can put some money up to help that process along. But can you just give us an update in terms of the current thinking around the financing plan between now and the end of 2024 to get those lines up and running to the point where we'll see some operating cash flow? Okay, let me uh, let me talk about that one. Uh, I appreciate the way the question was asked between now and 2024. We've got all the money we need to get through 2023. <laughs> if we want to uh, get uh, a line per quarter in 2024, uh, one is we're going to have a little bit of a staircase, a building effect where we line one will start creating cash and that will help with line two. So we won't need to in effect, get all of the money up front in order to buy those lines. Having said that, um, we will need we will need to raise money. It will be something around uh, the fourth quarter of 2023. And and if we if we are raising money, it'll be because we need machines. If we need machines, it's because our batteries are hit, and we need to make more of them. So I don't I don't anticipate that being a problem right now. We don't need money. We like people to um, follow the company and we'll give an opportunity to invest. Great. I'll take the rest of it offline. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from Ananda Bra from Loop Capital Markets. You may unmute and ask your question. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, TJ. Uh, Obviously, very helpful, all the details. And uh, Raj and the Jay, great to meet you. I, I guess the question question is, uh, with with all that's occurred and, and, and the changes, uh, you know, and, and sort of with the scrutiny you're bringing to uh, the Gen 2, has there any been, has there been, and, and, and the changes to Gen 1, any impact to the strategic account production qualification process? Uh, that that we should be aware of. Uh, very good question. We uh, we've been progressing our strategic accounts along pretty much as planned because most of the volume that they've been expecting is relatively low at this point. And um, but what is was really has been accelerating is actually the product out of the production line out of Fab One has been very high quality and very good results in the qualifications that we've been driving with those. So, um, you know, we feel like we're, we're right on schedule with, uh, with those uh, major accounts, strategic accounts. That's great, Ralph. And just maybe as a quick follow on, do you also then anticipate, Ralph, that, that you have an opportunity to ramp to what you had anticipated production volumes might be, say, you know, whatever your expectation was four months ago for production volumes for big for strategic accounts, whenever they do were to start to ramp, do you, do you still envision being able to, you know, hit similar volume ramps? Or is that, has that changed as a result of uh, Gen 1? Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to let Ralph answer that. <laughs> we're going to enjoy a small victory. We ship. 44, 42 cells last quarter. We're going to go out and have a drink and celebrate it. We told you when we're going to buy the equipment. We believe we'll be a manufacturing limit all the way up. So as fast, faster we can turn on the machines and make it, the better off we're going to be. But one thing I want to stop, I don't want to stop this. I love speculation. You know, it, it drives interest in the corporation. But one thing I don't want to participate in is the speculation of when you're going to be a billion dollar company. We are going to get big. You can calculate the revenue from four lines. I gave you enough data to calculate it. I deliberately did not calculate it for you because frankly, as the guy who ran the SPAC, I feel that's one of the problems with SPACs. I feel that SPACs put in too much money too early on the company side. They, they, there's a rush of capital that causes a lack of respect for capital. And on the investor side, everybody's looking for the next Google two quarters from now. We've got 2023. If you watch your trajectory in 2023, every time we build batteries, we'll put more people in that funnel. And, the, and, and that funnel is over a year long. It's one to three years long. 
So the other guys can bullshit all they want about we got this battery, you know, we, we grow CBD nanowires. Great, grow them, baby, because you got about 100 customers to put through a three-year fun funnel. That's what we're doing. That's what matters, and that's what builds value. And, yes, we, we will be big and important in the future, but this is my get them back on track, give, make a, get a, a beat, meet and beat kind of plan going. So I'm not, I'm not going to allow Ralph to, to speculate on, on billionaire city today, not today. All right. That's great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Our next question comes from Alex Potter from Piper Sandler. You may unmute and ask your question. Great. Thanks guys. I, I appreciate it. Um, so one, uh, question that I did have, um, you, know, you mentioned these targets that people put in SPAC decks, um, that they disavow almost immediately, uh, after publishing them. Um, is there anything in that SPAC deck regarding what you think the company is capable of doing from a margin standpoint, long-term given you know, updated thoughts regarding where the new, where, where the second fab is going to be located or anything else that would lead you to believe that the gross margin or the EBITDA margin uh, expectations that you originally had may require revision. Thanks. That's the only question. Okay. Uh, let me answer that one. I've been concerned about eventual profitability for a long time. You know, I ran a company, we had our honeymoon for three or four years. And then all of a sudden we hit head on into Korea Inc., Japan Inc. And, and frankly, you know, companies like Micron in the United States are they're animals they're difficult to deal with. <laughs> so I know eventually you only make your way in the world if you make something cheaper such that you can make a good gross margin, pay for your R&D to move to the next thing and still put something on the bottom line. So my feeling about profit is if it ever gets to be 20% and if I'm still on the board, I'm going to ask, why aren't you guys investing and, 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 and taking a lead with more new products faster or more new technologies faster? So to me, 20%, anybody claiming more than 20% profit just hasn't been out there yet uh, unless they're making software and their, their COGS is, 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 is really low. Um, we don't have the data yet, and, and that data will come from, in effect, unit economics where you take a machine use a, a Gen 2 machine and you look at how much it costs, that's why it's going to be in a low cost area. I want a high speed machine that also gets run by people who earn two bucks an hour. That's what you've got to have to be competitive. And, and we will look at that, those unit economics. We haven't gotten there in their plan yet, so we don't have a good answer for you. But I do believe this company can be quite profitable uh, with automated equipment in a low cost area in the electronics segment, the $13 billion electronics, portable electronics segment of the market. Don't have an answer today, but I, I'm, I'm, we're headed in the right direction and the strategic decisions we've made absolutely are the best for that. Very good, thanks a lot. Our next question comes from Derek Soderberg from Cantor. You may unmute and ask your question. Yeah, hey everyone, thanks uh, for taking the questions and uh, this was a, a phenomenal presentation so far. Um, so just piggybacking off the last question, um, you know, just looking at the last estimates from the SPAC deck, uh, TJ, is there any revision to the timeline uh, for the EX2 or the EX3 uh, or any changes made to Gen 2 that would, you know, lead you to change that timeline at all? Um, anything uh, to, to point to there? That's a really good question. Uh, you guys are they're pretty good. If you looked at my my guiding principles, and they'll be published so you can look at them again on the bottom, it says new technology plan. And it says we're going to have new technology plans for every product. That's a code word for we're going to have the discipline of manufacturing, specifications, schedules, execution of the schedule in R&D that we have that we have have to have manufacturing even to be around so that that uh i won't call it revamping but the the putting discipline into r d is is my second major project before i before i uh, uh go back to being an venture capitalist which is uh the factory and aj aj is going to do that 
and then and then fixing up R and D. I'm going to fix up a couple methods for uh, for for developing things. I'm not talking about do they have a battery and can they make it. They're very smart guys. I'm talking about can they make it on schedule. Can they predict how many people they need to do it. Can they refrain like all startups do from starting too many projects and then getting none of them none of them done. That process, a rudimentary form of it. Uh, I'm going to get in place. I'm working. I'm right halfway through that right now. New technology plan. Uh, I talked to Raj about it yesterday, uh, and and this is what he's done before in his companies. So, the answer to your question, then, when we do that, we're going to do a few things right. I can tell you, number two on the list is EX 1.5. So, taking our technology to the next node is there we we we've got we've analyzed the projects we need to work on that's a big one it will get funded and then we're going to watch it like a hawk i think the main thing that upper management can do is make sure it's staffed properly and we spend enough money on it and we demand through weekly meetings and attention that it stays on schedule and and we don't have the you know it, and it's not just this company it's every company uh, you know, as, as reason for being behind schedule, we've got to change that here. But EX 1.5 will not be one of the casualties, so I'll tell you that. Got it. Well, that was my only question. I uh, appreciate all the detail. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from Gus Richard from Northland Securities. You may unmute and ask your question. Yes, thanks for letting me ask a question. Um, I was just wondering, you gave us, you know, the feedback from investors. What has been the feedback from your customers so far? So we've uh, received uh, excellent feedback from the Fab One samples in particular. Again, as TJ pointed out, that is a, a key aspect is we're giving them production units to do their, you know, integration testing and final qualifications. We're, you know, those tests take somewhere around three plus months to get done. And we started shipping those products about the middle of the year, you know, this 22. So we're, you know, partially through that process. And um, we've been meeting all the specs and, you know, working through, um, you know, the uh, applications that these customers are going to be using these products in. And, and then just on a follow up, um, when when should we expect to see products with uh, Innovex batteries in them in the market? And it's really dictated by the release schedules of our customers. You can look at the funnel and the, the um, any customer that's sort of in the uh, QS100 and beyond phase is close to releasing a product. And um, so we have to be reliant on, on what their product release schedules are. We've been saying that in 23, you will see, you know, tangible evidence of that. Got it. And then the last one for me, in terms of the competitive landscape, you know, you're a little bit behind where you thought you would be at this point. Are your competitors catching up? Are you seeing other novel batteries in the market that could give you a run for the money? That was one of the uh, comments on competitors catching up that, that I, I tried to put in here, but I didn't focus enough on the actual R&D projects to, to find a use for it. But that is, that is a, a, an important question. Um, the other battery companies we see uh, typically have an anode. They have a, a competing way to use silicon in the anode, which you pretty much have to do, <laughs> except for QuantumScape. And their competing ways to have nothing in the anode except for for lithium, uh, but our, our competitors use silicon, uh, and they have different ways of cleverly getting it in there, uh, and they have they can all claim what's good. But the point is, that's all like an electrochemical society meeting, including us. So we can go in and debate with them and talk about why ours is better, why theirs is better. Where were your 9,000 batteries last quarter? Where's your 18,000 batteries next quarter? Couple quarters from now, the men will be separated from the boys. 
Uh, I, I can't think of an area that I've ever looked at in silicon. I used to laugh. There used to be an article a quarter on Gally Marsnide. Gally Marsnide will make much faster chips than silicon, blah, blah, blah. But now there's silicon carbide and, and it's, all, it's, all, it's basically professors talking about their projects as if they were uh, brought to market. What we're doing now and what you're seeing is how hard it is to bring something to market. And I'm talking technologically hard. The thousand little problems you never even thought about that all of a sudden smack you in the face and prevent you from shipping. That's the barrier separating us from the other guys right now. Everybody's got some plan for silicon. We're shipping it and that's going to differentiate us. Got it. Thank you so much. That's it for me. Our next question comes from Chris Souther from B. Riley. You may unmute and ask your question. Hey, thanks so much for taking my question and uh, providing so much detail on the call here. Um, so, you know, maybe just uh, one kind of quick one. On your letter uh, that you wrote kind of in, in November uh, when you joined um, uh, as executive chairman, TJ, um, you, you described part of the challenge being travel restrictions for Fab One equipment, violating EPR guidelines. Uh, it sounds like, you know, the Gen, you know, the Gen 2 lines now are completed, you know, as far as design, but I just want to get a sense what really needs to go down between, you know, now where the design is completed and the board approval as far as you know, confirming some of those, you know, slight changes it sounded like you made uh, mm -hmm. would be finished. Yeah, so those uh, are yeah, a good question, actually. Uh, repeat the question. Yeah, so let me repeat the question. So the question uh, that you asked was when TJ wrote the letter in November talking difficulties about uh, not being able to travel uh, to the equipment vendor site or for the equipment guys to come or the vendors come here. Uh, those are absolutely, those were uh, true statements. Uh, we are beyond that now. We, uh, I can tell you anecdotally, um, our engineers and the, uh, the photo of the engineer that you saw himself, he has made already six trips in the last, uh, I would say four months to the vendor site and working diligently on the proof of concepts. So this time, instead of just saying, okay, let's give you the PO and hope for the best and let them, you know, give us a machine which kind of works and we'll go see it or not. Um, this time we are building proofs of concepts which means smaller uh, machines that represent the heads, as TJ mentioned, which are actually working in action. And we have seen those, you see the videos of those, our engineers are over there uh, many, many times, and many of them actually. Uh, I'm going there personally uh, also this month uh, where I'll be visiting these, uh, these guys and establishing relationships with the, with the CEOs uh, myself. So a lot has changed since that time. And this COVID is, uh, you know, becoming a part of the, you know, what we're living with now rather than, uh, you, know, uh, you know, unknowns uh, about the pandemic, et cetera. Uh, that'll, that, that's helping us a lot. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tony Strauss from Craig Hallam. You may unmute and ask your question. Thanks, TJ, for hosting this. Um, I appreciate your bare knuckle approach in uh, the years covering Cyprus going way, way back. Um, my question was regarding the one of the slides where you had very heavy on the um, the wearable side, maybe less on the mobile handset side than I was expecting in terms of uh, kind of uh, designs and queue. Is that because your customers want to see if you can walk before you run? Um, you know, I'm just curious your thoughts on Clearly, the handset space is a lot more volume than the wearable space, and your expectations on kind of uh, the handset side. So let uh, let's have Ralph do the buy answer, and I'll do the make answer. Yeah, I think it's fairly simple to see. You know, when we went to market first, we went to market with a wearable cell, and that is what we've been ramping. And um, we have a second cell, which is primarily for the mobile applications. And you'll see some customers within the funnel, just a little further behind, essentially just in timing and similar with laptop. So it's, it's literally just a timing question. Um, it's not a problem of engagement. We have plenty of uh, significant, you know, uh, strategic customer engagement uh, in each of those, um, you know, those application areas. 
So from uh, my perspective, uh, I've always liked making stuff and I've always liked design and I've always had guys like Ralph and Dan McCraney that sold everything we made. So that, that was, that was cool for me. Uh, so first answer is I see more red ones on my, on my chart than I see blue ones and green ones. So we're working on a red one. Second answer is, uh, the red ones are about this big and the other ones are about this big and I can make more of these than I can make the bigger ones. Uh, third thing is in, in the mobile sector, it turns out you have a small, physically a small battery. It turns out our technology has an advantage which increases as the battery gets smaller. So we go from like 30% more energy, let's say in a cell phone size battery to like double the energy, 100% more in a small, in a very small battery. And that's because of the efficiency of packing and the, and the great mechanical engineering job the company has done. So I, I look at, in that, and that sector needs batteries badly because they, they, the, 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 they don't have very good batteries. <laughs> so I see that as a marketing opportunity where if you're in wearables and you don't have one of our batteries, you got to watch or some other appliance, a medical appliance, for example, that lasts half as long or even, even less than half as long. Uh, also with brake flow, uh, that will differentiate us. Uh, it, you, you can have, you can have heated batteries and burns from any size battery all the way down to the smallest battery. So I just see a huge opportunity in wearables to be king of the hill. It doesn't mean we're not doing the others. We sample every other battery. Uh, we sample batteries from super cell phone size batteries that are bigger than a typical cell phone and might be used three wide in a laptop, uh, all the way down to batteries that are, that are smaller or oddly shaped uh, for other, other applications. But right now, the guys that need us the most that run the highest volume that are wearables and we can make a bunch of them. We got a line. You're ready to rock and roll. Thanks for the detail, TJ. Appreciate it. Our next question comes from Sean Milligan from Janie Montgomery. Scott, I mean, I'm even ask your question. Hey guys, thanks for taking my question and thanks for the call. I just wanted to uh, clarify a little bit about um, the Gen 2 ramp. So you talked about delivering uh, first qual and uh, production sales in the third quarter of 2024 from the first uh, Gen 2 line. And then you mentioned that you expected uh, four Gen 2 lines in FAB 2, I think it was by the end of 2024. Um, so just trying to get a read on, obviously you have a lot of confidence about the initial Gen 2 line. And if I understand that correctly, you'll be adding or starting to add um, like line two, line three, line four, before production volume from that first line hits the market? That's, uh, that's again, a very good observation and, uh, and the right one, actually. Um, as you saw, the we have broken the, the schedule down into very defined milestones, right? In there, you would see factory acceptance test. It starts with a POC, design approval POC, uh, factory acceptance test, EPR, PCR2, then the production run. So the confidence is building in this milestone as by design, right? And it becomes at the a very high point when we finish doing the factory acceptance test. When we are actually at the vendor, the machine is working, is running, is running both the sprint UPH, it's running the uptime, it's running those types of things in proof, actually seeing it. That's when typically the confidence is high and you start triggering the long lead time items. So you have to manage the long lead time items in this whole timeline. And so that the delivery of the machines gets nicely compressed to your liking. If you wait all the way until then and then trigger the long, then obviously it will get stretched out. So we are not doing that. So as we build confidence, that's when we are triggering. Okay, great. And then to build on that, um, so I understand the initial, you know, uh, Gen 2 line is maybe pushed to the right a couple quarters, but TJ, you also mentioned that you would ex expect subsequent lines um, to come on at a higher kind of initial uh, capacity utilization. Can you kind of clarify that? Because I think like 
you know, in the model, if you're running or building one line a quarter and you, you kind of prorate them out on the ramp up, there's obviously a, you know, big capital need. Um, but if, if they come on higher than expected initially, maybe that shrinks that need. Um, I'm just trying to understand some of the gives and takes on the, the kind of, ex I guess, the extension of uh, the initial Gen 2 line, but then the compression of, of when subsequent lines could come online. Right now, we put in one line a quarter in 2024, the, the fourth line going in in Q4. Uh, frankly, uh, that is a reasonable rate. Uh, that, that we've all experienced in our past life. Uh, we need a chance to refine that. Uh, there's, they certainly will come online faster. You know, the fourth line is going to come in and be making, making uh, in the mid quarter that it comes in, it's going to be making units because the problems will have been solved. The first line is going to be faster because of our experience on line one that I already talked about. Um, we're comfortable that we can do one line a quarter once we get going that that's been our, our experience for putting equipment online okay and then some of the capex i think uh gen 2 the initial line was quoted like 50 to 70 million um just curious if there's uh you know bias downward on reorders and, and what we can expect there the uh, 50 to 70 million was 55 million for the equipment and and then 15 million to hook it up um the incremental machines will be 55 uh and i'll point out that hasn't made it through the board yet and i'm the chairman uh so i i plan to have another whack at capital costs i've been a capital cost hawk uh since we got going uh i i i compromised on a real tight uh uh, scrutiny of capital cost on the first machine because it was more important to us economically to get it running than it was to make it uh, five or ten million dollars cheaper. But my experience is that as you learn, you also learn how to make things cheaper. We have ways right now, I, I could articulate them, where chunks of that machine disappear. Like, like some of those steps I showed you in that chart just go away. And we're not ready to talk about them yet, uh, but but we will make this thing cheaper per a manufacturing unit over time. There's no doubt in my mind about that. All right, that's all. Thank you guys for the call. Our next question comes from Chip Moore from EF HUD. You may unmute um, and ask your question. Thanks. Uh, TJ, you talked about trying to get brake flow and production uh, on the Gen 2 line as, as soon as possible. Can you expand on that a little bit maybe? Are there any limiting factors uh, in, in terms of any risks of delays as you focus on ramping up initially or, or how should we think about that? This goes back to my comment, the gray comment, meaning added later, new technology plans. Every new technology plan will have a schedule and it'll have a project management officer looking at the schedule and tracking it and that, that's what keeps uh, companies on, on schedule. Right now, and this, th this is active debate in the company, and, and just like you can't spend money to get something done, the, the uh, executive chairman can't say, we will do this, and then, then you know it actually happens. You've got to get people to agree that it's going to happen. My own view is Gen 2 itself limits brake flow. Uh, we're not going to try to put brake flow on, on line one. Uh, because we, we, all that work would be obsoleted or at best case would, would come out slowly at a low, on a low UPH line. So I see brake flow as being limited by Gen 2. There's, there's debate on brake flow um, right now, whether or not there's a, a bunch more R&D to get done. And we're not ready to talk about that yet. I can tell you there's one page of guiding principles and brake flow is written there in big letters. So it's going to get attention and we're going to bring it to market. That's going to be a differentiator, is a differentiator for this company. And I think when the Chinese uh, are making super cheap batteries, uh, they'll if they're high energy batteries, they got a problem because high energy batteries burn and, and the worse they get, the worse they burn. The, for example, automotive batteries, although they do have fires, 
are less fire prone than the high energy batteries that, that, that we're talking about. So they'll have a choice, high energy, low energy. If they pick high energy, they'll be on the, on the worst part of the curve for risk. And we're going to be on a second or third generation brake flow. We think it's, uh, it's going to be, we're hoping, you know, if you want to pick the marketing campaign that did the best of anybody, it's Intel inside, right? We, we think brake flow inside is going to be something you have to talk about. You have to talk about the equivalent of from some competitors. They're going to have to stay up with us on this. Brake flow is enabled, I'll just remind you, by your architecture. We can get into every single uh, leaf or every single wave on that battery. And uh, they can't because they got this roll. Uh, we, we think it's going to be a differentiator and we're going to push it. Got it. Perfect. I could sneak in one last one more, I guess, a clarification. Um, great to see Samsung, then you disclose them. Um, are you able to confirm if, if they're the MOU announced uh, last quarter? You've, uh, you've gotten beyond my depth. You're asking a legal question when you ask MOU. Uh, I'm old enough to know that when you get asked a question you don't understand, you just say, I don't know. So I, I'll, I'll pass on that one. I do yeah, know, I, try. Thanks. I do know, I do know, and I thank Samsung for allowing us to tell the world they're interested in our stuff enough to get samples. That's a big deal of validation. Absolutely. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. With that, I'd like to turn it over to TJ Rogers for closing remarks. Thank you very much for uh, being so patient with a, a long, a long presentation. Uh, we're very enthusiastic about the company. Uh, we're starting to ship. Our ship rate is doubling quarter on quarter. Our, our technology does work and uh, stay tuned on, on gen two. Uh, we, we, we're very confident about it. We've got the designer the other guys don't have. We've got a design. And on March 15th, you're going to find out if it passes scrutiny, which means days in the boardroom looking at box by box and not just waving your arm at a PO. So we think Gen 2 will be a big deal. Uh, and we're very enthusiastic about the company right now. And I got some new guys to run it so I can go back and, and do my job. Thank you. 